Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. Well, greetings, everyone. Welcome to Hotline Ministry. Can we say that we love God if we don't love Jesus? We're going to talk about, about that in just a few moments. Well, greetings once again. Welcome to Hotline Ministry. I'm Pastor Harold Noyce, pastor of the Community Christian Church in Athens, Vermont. Alongside is my co-host, Pastor Timothy Golden. He is pastor of Life on Main in Charlestown, New Hampshire. And we have been discussing over the last number of months um, the 31 reasons why Jesus came to earth. And the very first reason, of course, is that Jesus came to earth to do the will of his Father. And each and every uh, reason beyond that or after that has to do with the will of the Father. Well, today we are, we are in reason number 30. I think we also spent last week on reason number 30. But today <laughs> we're on reason number 30, is that Jesus came to be loved by God's children. To be loved by God's children. Now, I've had Tim and my ministry people say to me, I love God, but not Jesus. Hmm. Or I believe in God, but I don't believe in Jesus. Um, is it really possible to separate the two? I mean, because it just seems like, in, as I look at Scripture, you can't separate the two. You need to, if you love God, you better, you know, Jesus is there too. Or mm -hmm. if you love Jesus, God is there too. Right. Um, but, you know, some people, you know, they want to love God, but they just don't want to accept who Jesus Christ is. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that, can you? you? You can't do that. And the mere fact that, and, and just said, we're going to be looking at that quite in depth here as we look at these scriptures. But in that statement, you already see what some of the presuppositions are that people are coming at it with. And some of those main presuppositions are this, that the Father, who's who they're referring to as God, that somehow the Father is God, but Jesus is not. Right. Because to say I love God, but I don't love Jesus, is to somehow separate Jesus from being part of the Godhead. And you cannot read Scripture in its entirety and come to that conclusion. Right. God doesn't give us that option. The, the Father does not give us that option. Right. You know, and as we were talking over breakfast this morning, that, you know, it would be almost the same like in our own families. You know, how can someone say, well, pastor, I love you, but I can't stand your wife? Well, wait a minute. You can't separate the two of us. Mm -hmm. We are a team. Right. You know, and if you love me, you better love my wife, too, because, you know, that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. um, and even greater still, of course, is the Godhead. Mm -hmm. You know, I know that there are churches, for example, that, that want to just preach God the Father and eliminate God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Right. There are some churches who just preach God the Holy Spirit and eliminate Jesus and the Father. You mm -hmm. can't do that. You have to involve the whole Trinity. That's it. Or you're not really involving any of it, mm -hmm. at least as I see it. Right. And, and we actually see that, <clears throat> and I like the fact to use that analogy about a husband and a wife, and, you know, if you love me, you love my wife, you know. Um, because really, if, and it seems so many times we go back to Genesis, but when you look at Genesis, and the one thing that God created that he said was not good was man alone. Yep. And why was that not good? He had relationship with the Father, but there's something that the Father wanted to portray in that marriage relationship 
about who he is. We were created in the image of God. Man was created in the image of God. But that's not talking about man as in just male. That was mankind. Human, human, human. So we together resemble something of the um, nature of who God is in his Trinitarian form. And there's, and he said what? That you will become one flesh. And that's not just talking about the physical union that takes place. It's talking about the sense of oneness that exists that you now, when, when that couple comes together, you cannot separate the two. They are one and, and they operate as one. And it's the same thing with the Godhead. You know, and, and Adam even said, she is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I mean, that gives us the very vivid picture of the oneness in which they are. Mm -hmm. Tim, why don't you ask the Lord to bless today as we get into these scriptures and try to help people to see that if you say you love God, but you can't say you love Jesus, then you're missing the whole point. You're mm -hmm. missing what is absolutely necessary for salvation mm -hmm. and this is necessary for a relationship with God the Father. Mm -hmm. So why don't you ask the, the Lord to be with us and then we'll read some scripture and get right into it. Sure. Lord, we just thank you right now for the for the incredible blessing of your written word. The your message to us, Lord, that you have transcribed through so many authors. Uh, throughout the course of time and across so many different nations and so that we could see a good picture of who you are in your fullness as the Trinity. And so, Lord God, we ask that today you would open our hearts, open our minds to receive the truths from you that you would have us learn so that we can rightly understand uh, what it means to love you as well as to love your Son, to love the Spirit, God. Mm -hmm. We give you honor, we give you praise in your holy name. Amen. Amen. You know, we're going to be looking into John chapter 8, also John chapter uh, 14, John chapter 10, Matthew 11. There's a number of scripture verses all through the New Testament especially mm -hmm. where it talks to us and tells us that we cannot separate mm -hmm. any part of the Trinity from the wholeness of the Trinity and still be in a relationship with God. You can't do it. That's right. So I'm going to read out of John chapter 8, starting with verse... 42 and going down to verse 47. Now Jesus is the one speaking. He's the one doing the, the, the talking at this point. Jesus said unto them, verse 42, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father the devil. And the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. You, therefore, hear them not, because you are not of God. Well, to me, that's pretty point, pretty point blank yeah. of what he is saying. You know, you cannot believe in God the Father and deny God the Son. Mm -hmm. You can't do it. Right. Uh, Jesus and other portions of Scripture says, I and my Father are one. Mm -hmm. You know, the same as you were pointing out in the Genesis account. Adam was saying, I and Eve are one. Mm -hmm. Bone to bone, flesh to flesh, we are one. We are mm -hmm. one flesh. Well, it's the very same thing with the Trinity of God. Not only mm -hmm. God the Father, God the Son, but also God the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And he is saying, now, if you say you love God, but you hate me, then you're not of the Father. Mm -hmm. And he even goes and was so bold to say, and I'll tell you who your father is. Mm -hmm. Your father is the devil. Why? Because the devil wants to do everything he can to deny mm -hmm. Jesus Christ and who he is and what he accomplished mm -hmm. for mankind upon the cross at Calvary, upon the burial, upon the resurrection, the ascension, the, you know, being seated at the right hand of the Father. There's so much that Christ accomplished mm -hmm. that we ourselves could not accomplish. Mm -hmm. Yet people don't want to accept Christ today. According to this, in Jesus' analysis, is because they don't want to hear the truth. That's right. 
And uh, that seems like a pretty reasonable argument, especially in the day in which we are living. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, because this is in the, in the midst of a big political season and the election's coming up in another month or so. And I see on the side of the road these little placards that says, Truth Matters. Now, I don't know who put that placard out there. I don't know what side or what whatever. That doesn't matter to me. But what matters to me is the fact that that is absolute truth. Mm -hmm. It matters. And that's what we need to do. And they refuse to listen to what Jesus Christ has to say because they don't want to hear the truth. That's it. And there's a reason that he said that, too. He wasn't just telling them. It wasn't like he was trying just to attack them. What he was doing by telling them that they're fathers of the devil is he was actually answering and trying to correct them. Because if we actually scroll up just a little bit earlier in that, just a few verses, um, in the midst of this discussion, they were answering to Jesus saying that Abraham is our father. Right. And Jesus says, well, if, he, if you were Abraham's children, you'd do the works of Abraham. But you're not. And then they actually come back and say to him, we were not born of vacation. We have one father, God. Yeah. And so this is in a direct response to what it is they're saying. It's like, you're saying God is your father, but yet you're not accepting me. So let me tell you who your real father is. Mm -hmm. You know, are you hearing the own just the, the deception? You're, you're you're caught up in a lie, and you are defending it in pride. And so, because of that pride, I need to bring you back to the reality. And so that's what he was doing and helping them understand. No, look, your father's the devil. Yeah. You you've prompted you've required me to give you this response because of your deception that you're being sucked into by thinking that you're righteous when you're not. When you're actually denying God Himself in the flesh, which is me. Yeah, now isn't that, to me, one of the great works of the devil and, and of Satan himself, is he'll give you just a little bit of scripture, mm -hmm. and that's what he did when Jesus, remember when Jesus was oh, being yeah? tempted upon the mountain, he gave a little bit of scripture, and then he kind of uh, deviated mm -hmm. from, the, from the truth and, and went to the lie, and Jesus had to straighten him out again. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what he does, you know, when he tries to tell people, well, you can believe, as long as you believe in God the Father, then your salvation is secure and all of that. And that is not true. Mm -hmm. You know, because God the Father sent God the Son, his, his Son, to die upon the cross at Calvary so that we could have a relationship mm -hmm. with God the Father. But without God the Son, you cannot have a relationship with God the Father. You can't do it. It's, it is. it's an impossibility. And, and sometimes... It amazes me, um, and I think sometimes it prompts us to have to ask certain questions. And we talked about this a little bit earlier over lunch, that, um, or I should say over breakfast. Breakfast, <laughs> I guess, yeah. But um, that what do we mean when we say we believe? You know, these people are saying that, you know, I believe in God, but I don't believe in Jesus. Yeah. What do you mean by I believe in him? Is it, is it kind of that same kind of concept that we carry when, as a child, we said, I believe in Santa Claus? Yeah. You know, it, it's a, just a belief system. When Scripture says that we need to believe on him, what that's coming into is understand who I am and be willing to place your trust in me. And so to say I believe in God, say, God, I'm willing to put my trust in you. Well, if you put your trust in him, that means you're going to trust the word that he has given us, the written right. word in the Bible, and he makes it clear that Jesus is the son. But then you got this other group of people that are like, well, okay, well, you know, I can't really accept Jesus as God, but, you know, I can accept him as a good prophet. Yeah. Well, you know, this passage we read right now just discredits that because he did not give us the option to think of him as just a good prophet or a good teacher. The mere fact that in this passage he is saying, guess what, people? I am God. If you've seen the Father, you've seen me is really what he's talking about. Me and the Father are one. How can you say that and be a good teacher? Mm -hmm. he, the only way would be if that is true. And if that is true, then he is not just a good teacher. He is God as he proclaims to be here. But if you're not willing to accept that he is God, then basically what we're saying is he's a lunatic based on this because he's equating himself, placing himself on a similar plane as the Father. And so the option does not stand to be a good teacher. He's, he made it. So you either have to choose one or the other. Either I am God or you believe I'm not. And if you think I'm not, then you are basically 
not only not loving me or not accepting me, you are not accepting the Father because not only did the Father, am I one with the Father, the Father sent me here. Right. I am here doing the will of the Father. And so to deny what I am here to do, it's to deny God himself. Yep. Yeah, you know, and, and it almost looks like in verse 43, he goes and, and he even shares to me that you are refusing to listen to my word. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not that, that you know, you just can't comprehend it. Mm -hmm. You're refusing it. Because I look at verse 43. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. Mm -hmm. So you're refusing to listen to me. You're refusing to understand what I am saying. You're refusing to recognize me. You know, one of the things that, that Tim, that I like to uh, kind of spend a lot of time on mm -hmm. is not real, not using the words believing in God, I like eliminating the word in and just put believe God. Mm -hmm. You know, because if I believe in God, then what I'm doing is I'm believing in something that's, that's out there, you know, and I'll accept these parts of him but not mm -hmm. these parts of him. I prefer to say, I believe God. Mm -hmm. That means every dot, every tittle, every word, everything mm -hmm. that's in this book, I believe. Because all scripture was given by inspiration of mm -hmm. God. And all scripture is profitable. Mm -hmm. You know, and therefore, you know, whether I believe it or not is immaterial because God wrote it and therefore it's truth. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, Harold, this is this is who I am. Mm -hmm. Believe me. Yeah. You know. Well I love I love the um the situation. I uh, don't don't want to say it's a story because it was a real life thing that happened. But it really I think paints this picture, this difference, as you said, between believe in and believe. Um, and I can't remember what the guy's name was, but he was a tightrope walker. And he had, um, was the first one to be able to walk a tightrope across Niagara Falls. And so what he did is, you know, there's of course a whole group of people there to watch him mm -hmm. do this. And, and so he asked some of the questions. Do you believe that I can go across this? And that was like, well, we hope so. <laughs> you yeah. know? Uh, we're here to find out. So he walks across, comes back. And then um, the next time he says, now I'm going to do it again. This time I'm going to take a wheelbarrow across. Do you think I can do it? Do you, have, do you believe I can? Yes, we believe you can do this. Then he asks a question. Now who's going to get in the wheelbarrow? And nobody stepped forward except for one. There's this little, there's this little old lady that stepped forward said, I'll get in the wheelbarrow. And he took that woman across and back. Who was the woman? It was his mother. Yeah. You know, nobody else. Everyone was like, yeah, we believe you can do it. But when it came time to prove their yeah. belief, they were not willing to make that step. They didn't have true belief. Yeah. Only the mother did. Why? Because of the relationship she had with her son and what she knew her son was capable of. Yeah. And that's what we're talking about. Do we have that kind of belief in God that, that we really trust what it is he has to say and are willing to take it at face value right, right. and understand it as truth? Right. You know, it's what's really interesting because as Jesus is talking to us here in these verses, and then we get down to verse 44, in my view at least, Jesus points out their, their big problem. And their big problem is this. You are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. Well, what was the, mm -hmm. what was the big lust of Lucifer? He wanted to become God. He wanted to become his God. So it was pride. Mm -hmm. Why is it that a lot of people refuse? You know, they say they believe in God, but they refuse to believe in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? Well, let's face it. Jesus kind of makes some claims. Yep. And if I acknowledge that he is God, then you know what? What he had to say means he's king, means he's Lord, means he gets to have some governance in my life. I no longer get to call the shots. If my existence is here simply because of chance or because of evolution, and which would be a whole discussion in and of itself for right, us right, to really yeah. get into, but to make those claims is to say what? I am here by chance, and if I'm here by chance, then I get to make my own rules, and I am not accountable to anybody. The minute we begin to understand that Jesus is sent of God, then that gives him a right to be able to say the things that he says and means that, I, that he does deserve lordship in my life. Mm -hmm. And now I have to sacrifice my pride 
to bring myself under submission to him. Yep, I have to be under submission. You know, there's a word that, that um, Jesus used and was used of him, and that is the word Savior. Mm -hmm. Seems to me that mankind, generally speaking, has an awful hard time recognizing Jesus Christ as our Savior. Mm -hmm. Why? Because I think I can save myself. Why? Because mm -hmm. I think I have the capacities mm -hmm. to take care of my own needs, and I don't need a Savior. Mm -hmm. Well, the Word of God says you need the Savior. Mm -hmm. Why? Because if I, if I need a Savior, that means that I must be all that God says I am. That means I am a sinner. Mm -hmm. That means that I am incapable of saving myself. That means that I need to have someone else do it for mm -hmm. me. And today in our world, we don't want to recognize a Savior. Mm -hmm. We want to recognize I, I mean, I'm a big boy, I pull up my straps, I can do it myself. And God says, no, you can't. This is one area you can't do by yourself. You mm -hmm. need the Savior. Mm -hmm. And mankind is having a hard time, at least uh, that I've seen in my ministry, is having a hard time recognizing that they need a Savior. Mm -hmm. And his name is Jesus yeah. Christ. Because I'm, I'm good enough. Yeah. I, I, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. The thing is, is understanding that our righteousness, even your best righteousness, will always fall short of God. And let's not even take God as the example for a moment. How many of us would be able to compare with Mother Teresa? Mm -hmm. How do our, how does our righteousness stack up to her? Most of us would have to say, it's not there. But yet even Mother Teresa understood her need for a savior. Right, exactly. Even with her level of righteousness, she knew she wasn't there, you know? And you talk to any of the great men and women of God that you've maybe heard of, whether it was the Billy Grahams, whether it was the Rabbi Zacharias's or whoever that have come and gone before us, every one of them will tell you the same thing. I needed Jesus. Right. His righteousness is the only thing that saves me. And we, if we can't reach their standard, then we need to understand we have fallen short. Yeah. So all of this, once again, as you have done earlier in this broadcast, is it all points back to the Genesis account. Mm. Because what was it that the serpent did to Adam and Eve? Mm -hmm. You know, he goes and he points out, look, God has said you can eat of all, these, all this fruit except this one. Because then you would have knowledge. Don't you want to be like God? Take this knowledge. Mm -hmm. Take this fruit. You know, and that's exactly what he's doing is he's, he's saying, hey, you don't need God. Mm -hmm. You know, you can become as God. And mm -hmm. certainly today in our world, in our culture, there's an awful lot of people who try to make themselves out that they're God. Mm -hmm. And they're not. Mm -hmm. And that's why all the other religions of the world seem so tantalizing to some people. Because mo all of them are based on me somehow trying to achieve mm -hmm. And me being able then to get to heaven and say, there, I made it. Yeah. And how did I make it? Because of what I did. And Jesus makes it very clear. It's not about what you can do. It's not by works of righteousness that I have done, but it's according to his mercy that he saves us. We're not capable of getting there. Scripture made it clear in that passage. It's only his mercy. Getting what, being given what we don't, don't deserve. deserve. Yeah, you know, you know, I mean, if we look at it, if, if heaven were a place where all of us can go up and we can lay out our resumes, mm -hmm. this, th these are the great things I've done, you know, and have you and me, for example, stand up against a Billy Graham or stand up against a Rabbi Zachariah or John MacArthur or Charles Stanley, mm -hmm. and you can na just name a host of, of tremendous men and women of God. Uh, where would we stack up? You know, mm -hmm. you'd have this great proud fest where, well, I did this, and I led this person to Christ, and I, you know, wait a minute, no, no, that's not what heaven's about. Right. Heaven is about the Savior, mm -hmm. so that none of us are going to be walking around in heaven and say, look at me, I got this many crowns, or I got this because I was so good. No, that isn't what heaven's going to be about. Right. Heaven is going to be about bowing before the Savior and praising Him because I couldn't do it on my own. Mm -hmm. That's what it's all about. But mankind today, they want to take their pride and they want to say, no, I can, I can accomplish this. Paul the Apostle, in, I think it's in Romans, or um, I can't remember it particularly, where he goes and said, I'm talking to you not as one who has apprehended, 
because I am still apprehending. Mm -hmm. You know, Paul will recognize the fact, wait a minute, even though I've done this, there's so much more I want to do. Not mm -hmm. for my salvation, but because of my salvation, I want to do That's that. That's right. You know, and so I, you know, it's not as though I have attained, mm -hmm. because I haven't finished work yet, but I am still attaining. Mm -hmm. Why? Because this is what God is doing. Yeah, it's really pairing together the messages of Paul. Yep. That it's only by grace, it's only by his mercy that we're saved. And pairing that together with the book of James, where it also says, though, that your faith without works is dead. But it's, it makes sure you don't get the cart before the horse. Yeah. It's understanding we can't do it, we can't achieve it. It's only, it's only through what Jesus has already done, through his death, through his resurrection, through his coming, um, that we have even the potential of being able to walk in right relationship with God. But once we accept that gift of blood, it does not negate the fact that now that faith has got to be lived out in my life. It's got to be lived yeah. out in the works that I do. Showing the world, showing those around me that I honestly, truly do believe what it is I profess with my lips. Yeah. And that is that Jesus is Lord. So what, you, what you're saying then, Tim, is this, is that you know, salvation is more than just fire insurance. Absolutely. You know, and a lot of people want to just use it as fire insurance. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm assured I'm not going to go to hell, but now I can go and I can live my life the way I want to live it. Mm -hmm. Not if you believe Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a little bit of what Jesus was referring to in the parable of the sheep and the goats. Yep. Where he talks about, and I'm going to separate the sheep from the goats when I get to the Father, but yet there's going to be those people that are going to say, Lord, Lord. You know, there's some people that think that for some reason or another, they're there. And they're not, because what did he say? I, I, you, know, you didn't do the things that were necessary, so I never knew you. Yeah. You know, and, and that knowing, again, is, it's talking of relationship. Yeah, it's, not, it's, it's not a belief system. It's not an ideology. It's a belief system. It's a, an actual relationship more than a religion. You know, our religiosity flows out of relationship. Right. You know, last Tuesday night, I, I, did, a, I did a message, a uh, Bible study on the Ten Virgins. And really, you know, it really opened up a bunch of eyes because, you know, when you read through it, you know, it's a good story and it's all this. But when you, when you put the, the actual account down, mm -hmm. you have ten virgins. They all have lamps. Mm -hmm. Five of them took an extra cruise of oil with them. Five of them did not take the extra cruise of oil. So that when the bridegroom came, the five wise ones that took the extra cruise of oil, they were prepared for his coming. The five who did not take the extra cruise of oil, their lamps went out. And you know what God did? He shut the door on them. Mm -hmm. They could not enter in. Mm -hmm. And you know something? I wonder how many people who have taken salvation mm -hmm. as just kind of a fire insurance or just kind of a thing where, well, Jesus came and he died for me, so I'll just... You know, I believe that, and that's as far as it's going to go. I'll I say, wonder the, where I'll they're say going. the magical sinner's prayer, yeah. and now I'm in. Yeah, and that's it. You know, I walked an aisle back at a Billy Graham's crusade, or I did this, or I did this, but there's nothing after that. Wait a minute. That is not the God that I know. Reminds me of the passage that we talked about last in our last episode, uh, where we were talking about he, uh, God saying, I am the vine, you are the branches. Yep. If you abide in me. Mm -hmm. Right, but if you're not abiding in me, what's going to happen? You're not going to bear much. You're not going to bear any fruit. Right. You know, you cannot be connected to God and not have the fruit of His life yep. take place in your life. It's a natural outflow. It happens, just as like with a tree. The branch doesn't try to determine. Oh, somehow I'm going to make this fruit happen. No. If it's connected to the vine, it's going to bear the fruit. Same way with us in our Christian walk. If it really is a true, genuine repentance, if it's a true, genuine seeking after God and not just lip service, saying mm -hmm. a prayer, as I said, just asking for that fire insurance or the get out of hell free card, you know, but it's really because I want to have a relationship with God, fruit will follow. I will want to do the things that please God. Just like when you love somebody, what do you want to do? You want to do things that make them happy. You want to do things that bring, bring pleasure to them because you love them. It's a natural outflow. Same thing in our relationship with God you know, and with Christ. And, and, and it is. And, you know, when Jesus goes and says, for example, in verse 20, uh, 45, excuse me, and because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Mm -hmm. You know, people are looking at it and say, wait a minute, I thought this was grace, and, and because it's grace, uh, I, don't, I don't have to do anything, I don't have to be anything. 
wait a minute, it's not that you have to, but because you want to. Second mm -hmm. Corinthians 5.17, key verse. Therefore, if any person be in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You become a new person. That means with a new heart, with a new desires, mm -hmm. with a new want. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a new want system. Yep. I want to serve God. I want to please God. I want to do what God would have me to do. Not just take his salvation. Paul talks about receiving God's grace in vain. Have I received God's grace in vain? I have if all I do is, is keep it to myself yep. and don't do anything with it. Mm -hmm. But we are not to take God's grace in vain. We are to take God's grace and give it out. It says, those whom has been forgiven much, much he's going to do required. much. Mm -hmm. You know, much is going to be required. And I've been forgiven a whole lot. Mm. And therefore, in my view, much is required of me. Why? Because of what God has forgiven me of. And therefore, I've dedicated my life to serving him. Why? Because, man, he gave me everything. Mm -hmm. He gave me everything. And, and Jesus goes and says, look, you don't believe the truth. You know, you believe me not. Why? Because I tell you the truth, you don't want it. For example, Matthew 28. It goes in verse 18, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. What did he say on his when he was checking out of this earth and going to heaven? Mm -hmm. Hey, I got a job for you guys to do. Yep. And this is what I've called you out to do. Go out into the world. Go out into the highways and the hedges. Go out and mm -hmm. give the word of God out. Why? Because that not, that is what I am commissioning you to do. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if you, if you say you believe in Jesus, and but you don't believe in his commissioning, then mm -hmm. there's something wrong. There's something very drastically right. mission, missing there. Because mm -hmm. what we do is we like to try to hit, you know, because we like to get hard on the Pharisees, but we do the same thing. We like to pick and choose the words of Jesus that we yep. think are, the, the, the ones that are easy to swallow. But you know, the things that are more difficult, we just cast those things aside. We try to reason them away. And that's a lot of what they were doing here. In fact, even after Jesus talked so harshly to them, down in verse 48, he then says that the Jews answered and said to him, do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan, which was the greatest insult you could give yep. a Jew, and then to take it even another level deeper, and you have a demon. Yep. So again, I have just made it very clear to you, there's been nothing, I mean, because he made mention earlier, he said, which of you convicts, in verse 45, which of you convicts me of sin? They couldn't, because in him there was no sin. Right. All they had to do was look at his life. There was nothing there, but yet he's got a demon. Okay, how's that work? Yeah, yeah. You know, but there again, when people set their minds on something, it doesn't matter what the truth is anymore. Truth no longer matters to them. What matters more is I want to be right. Yep. Yep. And that's where they were. They were not willing to receive correction. They were not willing to accept the fact that maybe he, this is, he really is who he says he is. His life has proven it, not just his words. Yep. Yep. But you know what? We are so set in our ways, we're not listening to it. We don't care how much proof he offers. You know, when I was in Bible college, uh, I had a, a, a great guy, his name was Richard Lewis, one of my professors, and there were times that it was very, very difficult to listen to him. He just spoke in a monotone, hmm. never changed pitch one bit, you know, and, and this, and it was hard for me to, to get used to that, mm -hmm. but when I finally got listening to what he had to say, I wanted to hear more of him, mm -hmm. even though he was not dynamic in any way, even though, you know, it was a monotone and, you know, you could go, oh, hum, this is boring. But because I wanted to hear God's word mm -hmm. and the doctrines of which Dr. Lewis was teaching that I didn't hear the monotone after a while. Why? Because I said, man, that's truth. And my ears were tuned in to the truth of what he was saying. Not the tone in which he was saying it, or not the lack of enthusiasm, because he would just stand there at the pulpit and with his two hands on the thing and just give it out to you and not move one, one inch, you know? I mean, he just wasn't. And, but once I finally got beyond that and I was listening to what he had to say, 
man, I wanted to listen to him more and more and more. And that's what Jesus is saying to us in verse 47. Mm -hmm. He that is of God hears God's word. It doesn't matter who it is that gives mm -hmm. it to you. You know, whether it's a Charles Stanley or whether it's a John MacArthur or whether it's, you know, a Harold Noyce or whatever, Tim Golden, mm -hmm. you know, whatever our, our inadequacies are, God's word can still be preached and heard by people. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's, that's how the Holy Spirit of God works. Right. You know, he can take the, the person in, and use them, whether they're dry and seemingly dull, even though I didn't, at the end, I certainly didn't call Dr. Lewis dull, you know, or someone who's very dynamic and flamboyant mm -hmm. and all of this. The thing is, is when I'm hearing the word of God, it doesn't matter who it is I'm hearing it from. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to hear the word of God. And he says this. He that is of God hears God's word. You, therefore, hear them not, because you are not of God. And if I say that I'm, you know, I believe in God, but I don't believe in Jesus, then guess what? You're not hearing God's word. Mm -hmm. Because God's word tells us emphatically that he is who he is. I'm going to go over to John chapter 14, one of my favorite portions of scripture. Mm -hmm. Before we go there, go though, again, yep. I think it's important for us to hear, it's in that verse where you just read, do you hear the promise in that? Because he said, he who is of God. So this is to those people specifically. What did he say? They'll hear God's word. It, it's not a matter of you have the possibility of or you, you, you have the potential of. He says, no, if you're of God, you're going to hear his words. They, they go hand in hand. The minute you are in relationship, how many people we have known, for myself, for yourself, and people we've talked to, they said, you know, I read the Bible before I knew the Lord, and it didn't make sense. Got but all of a sudden, once I came to know the Lord, and I read passages that I'd never understood before, now made sense to me. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they were able to actually hear God's voice. Yep. And so it goes hand in hand. So what he's saying is this is truth, and this is a... This is not open for discussion. If you know God, you're going to hear his words. But then he goes on to say then the reverse. So if you're not hearing, it's because you don't know God. Right. You know, it's not that you just turned a deaf ear. If you had God, you would hear. Yeah. And what he's saying is, is you know, you can, you can say all you want to, that I have a relationship with God. Mm -hmm. However, the proof is in the pudding. Mm -hmm. Right? If you don't hear his word, you don't want to hear his word, mm -hmm. you neglect his word, then you don't really know him. Because the word know means have a relationship. It does not talk about head knowledge. Right. It talks about heart relationship. Mm -hmm. If I, I, you know, I knew Patty and we had three kids, mm -hmm. all right? Why? Because we had an intimate relationship and I knew her. Therefore, it's the same word being used mm -hmm. about knowing God, having that intimacy where, you know, we are going to reproduce Christians. Mm -hmm. That's what's going to happen. Yep. People are going to look at our lives and they're going to say, hey, you're different. Well, I know I'm different in a lot of ways, but mm -hmm. in some ways I'm different good because God has given me yeah. this kind of a heart. So God has given mm -hmm. me this kind of a love for his word. And how many times do we see couples that have been married for, well, it's getting rarer and rarer yeah. anymore, but when you see couples that have been married for 40, 50, 60 years, and then you look at them, and they even have begun to look, look like, like each them. other. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and why? Because of the depth of intimacy yeah. that they have with one another, the fact that they have lived life together on every level for so long you literally rub off on each yeah, other yeah. In, in a lot of ways. And it's the same way in the kingdom of God. The longer we're with him, the more we're walking out that intimacy with him, each and every day we begin to look a little more and a little more and a little more like him. Yep. You know, I love, there's a bunch of old hymns in our hymns that I, I still love. We still sing a lot of the old hymns, by the way, in our church. Mm -hmm. and, and I know Tim does. Um, you know, more about Jesus, what I know. Yep. You know, more and more about Jesus. That is, that's where it's all at. If yes. I know him, I want to know more mm -hmm. and more and more about it. Patty and I have been married 48 years. I know it's hard to believe sometimes, but pa Patty and I have been married 48 years, and you know something? I'm still learning about mm -hmm. Patty. Yeah, and, and coming back to what we talked about last week with the woman at the well, it's understanding that Jesus satisfies. Yep. You know, he, he made that comment that he who drinks of this water will thirst no more. There's a satisfaction that comes. But at the same token, the oxymoron is 
you want more. Yep. There, there's, I mean, it, it, it takes care of the need, but there's an ever increasing hunger and thirst yep. for even more of more him. More, more, more. You know, and, and, and I tell you what, you cannot exhaust mm -hmm. the Word of God. No. I mean, I have preached on certain portions of Scripture probably a dozen times in my, in my ministry, but you know something? Every single time I find something new. Mm -hmm. Every single time the Holy Spirit of God says, oh, let's expand this a little bit for you and give you a little more depth of what I am talking about. I've learned that, for example, in doing the parables. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and the group that I've been teaching the parables on on Tuesday nights, they all leave saying, I never saw that in there. You know, I was just reading it as a story. I was just reading it as a parable. And I never saw the depth of what Jesus was really giving when he was doing the parables, mm. you know. But now we're starting to dig deeper into them and say, wow, there's so much depth there. But the thing is, is you, you've got to know him to be able to read his word and apply right. his word. And you cannot love God the Father without loving God the Son. You mm -hmm. can't do it. Right. You know, and it, and, and it really frightens me mm -hmm. um, with people who say, well, I love God, but I don't love Jesus. No, mm -hmm. you can't do that. Mm -hmm. and, and coming along with that is understanding that God is love. Yeah. You know, and that love goes so deep that we have a hard time really understanding. We have some glimpses of it where we can look at our own earthly relationships and see how deep love can go. But our, the depth of our love is like the shallow end compared to the deep end for God. And I think one great pitch we have of what love looks like to the Godhead is in the book of Acts, um, when during Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. Yep. And Paul finds himself encountering Christ and the risen Christ, who looks at him and does not say, why are you persecuting the believers? Yep. His response was, why are you persecuting me? me? Yep. Well, hold it, you're not here, your people are here, but do we understand the depth of love that God has so much to the point, and this is hard, I mean, if you really begin to think about this, it'll, it'll, it'll stop you dead in your tracks, because to stop and think that the God of all creation, because through Christ all things were made, John 1 mm -hmm. tells us, and to think that he doesn't just look at me as his creation, he looks at me as a part of him. As his family, yeah. You know, to the point that if you mess with me, or if you mess with my family, you're messing with me. Yep, yep. And if he has that kind of relationship with a fallen people that are broken, that have wandered away from him, but he can have that level of love there, and if God and the and Son are one, do we understand the depth of love that God has for the Son? Yep. And that the Son has for the Father, who are both perfect, do we see the level of oneness? If he can have it here with us, how much more does it exist there? Yeah. And this is why he's saying, if you don't love me, you cannot love the Father mm -hmm. because we are that connected. Right, right. And that is, that is absolute truth. Folks, you are hearing truth today um, with, with no hesitancy at all because mm -hmm. if you don't know Jesus, you don't know the Father. That's right. And, and vice versa. And we didn't write the book. And we didn't write the book. We're just the messengers. <laughs> Listen to what Jesus says. And now he's talking to his disciples. And Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am. That is his God name. The I am. Mm -hmm. The same name that Moses said, God, who do I say sent me? And God says, tell him the I am sent you. All right? So Jesus is now putting that name on himself. Verse 6, I am. The way, the truth, and the life, mm -hmm. no man, that means no human being, all right, comes to the Father but by me. In other words, if you're going to know the Father, you, you have to know Jesus. Mm -hmm. You don't know Jesus, you don't know the Father. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. It's that straight. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just how it is. I cannot say I know the Father without knowing Jesus. Mm -hmm. I can't and, do it. And I like the way... Um and even the New King James changes, changes just one word from the King James. And, but it means basically the same thing, takes it even a little bit deeper. No man comes to the Father except through, through me. me. Right. And, you know, and that goes along with this concept uh, also in the book of John where Jesus says, I am the door. 
You know, there's only one way into the room. There's not a number of different doors. There's one door right. into relationship with God. That's what Jesus has proclaimed to us. That's what he's saying in this verse. I am that door. You can't go through the wall. Yeah. You want to have relationship with the Father. It's only going to happen first if you have relationship with me. Right. But you know what? You have that relationship with me. I'll throw the door wide open for you to go to the Father. In fact, not only will I throw the door open, I will be there on your behalf every day, mm -hmm. interceding to the Father on your behalf and all this sort of stuff. And acting as your high priest, I am in this with you because you know what? We are one. Yep. Because I have my identity in you and you have your identity in me. He who abides in me and I in him. Right, exactly. Just like we looked at in John 15 last mm -hmm. week. You know, if you go down to verse 7, there's a word if. And, and I like to use that word if, Tim, as because or since. Mm -hmm. So if you read it this way, because you have known me, you should have known my father also. If you know me, you will know my father. Mm -hmm. If you don't know me, you won't know my father. Right. Okay. It, it is just that cut and dry. And then he says, uh, and then, and from henceforth, you know him and you have seen him. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Mm -hmm. Okay? So therefore, he goes and he's just saying to them, look, there's only one way, and I'm it. Mm -hmm. You cannot say you know my Father without knowing me. And that's what's so great about knowing Jesus. And if, uh, the fact that, I mean, apart from the fact that he came to die for our sins. Right. And, and, and rise so that we can have hope of an eternal life with him. Even apart from all that, is to understanding that in the Old Testament, we understand what God thought. We, we understood his values. We understood through, through the Ten Commandments and things of that what his character was kind of like. But only through Jesus do we see what it looks like when it's lived out. Yeah, yeah. You know, before that, we didn't really get a good picture of it. We had some little glimpses maybe through a couple of the prophets, but not really because most of them were, they were all broken too. You know, in, and Jesus, God makes no bones about helping us see what some of their faults were. Right. But when Jesus came, we got to not only know what the Father's values are, we got to see what those values look like on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. How they were lived out. Yeah. You know, they were lived out by, by Christ Jesus himself. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly now because we have put on Christ, mm -hmm. which is what Paul tells us in the, in the epistles. You put on, you take it and you put on Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, that is an act of your will. That's an act yep. of, of, of you saying, this is what I want. It's mm -hmm. the same thing with salvation. Lord, I am a sinner. I, I need your great gift. I mm -hmm. take your free gift that you have given to me through your son upon the cross of Calvary and the victory that you have given because of your resurrection and your ascension and being seated at the, Father, at the right hand of the Father. I take that gift today. It's an act of my will. And Lord, I don't want to live to myself anymore. Mm -hmm. I want to live to you. Yeah. And that is the key. In verse 9, Jesus says the same thing. John 14. Jesus said, have I been with you so long, a uh, long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, mm. Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Wait a minute. If you see me, you see the Father. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I find it very interesting, and once again, you know, try not to get into the political realm too much, but, you know, uh, with, the, with the nominee for Supreme Court Justice, and... It seems like their big argument is the fact that she's a charismatic Catholic. And you know something? If, if people were to judge me on how I live my life and how I live out the faith, mm -hmm. to me that's a pretty good um, uh, accommodation or mm -hmm. rec uh, you know, that, that she's been given. She's living out her faith. Mm -hmm. And, you know, man, I wish, I wish people would look at me and say, Harold... I don't like you because you're living out your faith. Mm -hmm. And who do I want sitting in a place of judgment Yeah. in, in my country than somebody that I know has got some scruples? Yeah, yeah, you know, who's, <laughs> going, to, who's going to live out their faith. And, yeah. and man, if that is their biggest argument against a woman, and I don't know her personally, but it seems like if that's their big argument, man, I tell you what, they got nothing to stand on because that should be what they ought to be determining yeah, you know, mm -hmm. um, I hope that they can look at you and me and say, hey, I don't like them because they're living out their faith. Yeah, they're that's living it, out what let me preaching. be guilty as charged. Yeah, I don't be. that's it. Matter of <laughs> fact, you know, you heard way back when, you know, uh, if you were to stand, stand before a judge on your Christian faith, would you be found guilty? 
Mm-hmm. Or would he be able to say, no, you're not really a Christian because you do this, 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 or because you're not serving him, because you're not giving out the commission, you're not doing this. Mm-hmm. No, you're not a Christian. Or would he judge me and say, you are because. This is what your life is living out. Mm-hmm. And that's what Jesus is saying. You live out your life. Why? Because you know me. And because you know me, you know my Father. That's right. And therefore, you know, it's being lived out the way that it needs to be lived out. But, and, good, but good for us to see there, too. I, I, I find Christ's um, question there in verse 9. Have I been with you so long, and yet you don't know me? Yep. And how many times do people say, you know, I've read the word. I've gone to church all my life, but yet, do we know him? Yep. We maybe, maybe we've done the religious acts. Maybe we've made some professions. Maybe we've, you know, we're hanging out with a lot of Christians. Maybe we go to a Bible study every week. But you know what? That doesn't mean you know him. You know, whether or not you know him deals with that intimacy. Yep. You know, and it's not to say, it's not to downgrade the importance of going to church. We should be. Right. Every believer should be in a church somewhere that's preaching the Word of God. Yep. Because without you being there, God created you to be part of that family. Right. And, and the church is missing out because you're not there. And you're missing out because you're not there. Right. So let me just make that plug. Again, not that you have to come to either of our churches. Just make sure it's a Bible-preaching yep. church. Um, but seek God. Get to know Him. You know, there's one last verse, and Colin has already given us a high sign, so we got to... Do it, but one last verse, John 10, verse 30. Listen to what Jesus says. Phenomenal statement. It's only six words. I and my Father are one. You know me, you know the Father. You know the Father, you know me. Mm-hmm. Period. Yep. And that's it. And, and our question for you this, this morning is this. Do you really know him? I'm not asking you, do you know about him? I'm not asking you if you know the historical facts about who Jesus is and all that. That isn't what I'm asking you. I'm asking you, do you know him? Mm -hmm. Do you have an intimate relationship with him? I mean, people laugh at me at times because they, I'll be driving in my car, my truck, and I'm the only one in the truck, and they can see my my lips moving, and they say, Pastor, I saw you driving your truck the other day, and you were talking to somebody. Who are you talking to? Oh, I was talking to the one in the the passenger seat. There was nobody there. Yes, there was. His name is Jesus. And he and I were having a discussion, you know, and, you know, but that's, that's the kind of intimacy mm-hmm. we're talking about where, wait a minute, he's with me no matter where I am, mm-hmm. no matter where I go. And he and I can have a discussion anytime. And I want to have discussions mm-hmm. with him all the time because I, I love him and I have a relationship with him. And he, as he says, you are my friends. Mm-hmm. You're not only my friends, but you're my brethren. Mm-hmm. You know, he even gets more intimate. You go from a friendship to a brother. I have friends that I call a brother. I mean, mm-hmm. Tim's one. You know, he, he's my friend, but he's my brother. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and, and it, it just gets that close and that yeah. wonderful. And that's what Jesus Christ wants to be with me. I hope you have a relationship with him today. If you don't, you simply can say, Jesus, I thought I knew you, but I don't. Would you come into my life and save me right now and develop mm-hmm. in a relationship with me that I can know beyond a shadow of a doubt Mm -hmm. that I have a relationship with you. Lord God, I want that. I desire that. Come into my life. Save me. Cleanse me. Make me a part of your family because I want to know you better and better every day. Mm -hmm. I'm Pastor Harold Noyes, pastor of the Community Christian Church. We are found in uh, Athens, Vermont on the lower road. We have morning worship at 930 we have evening worship at 6, so if your church does not have an evening study and you'd like to have an evening study or go to a place that you can come out uh, to Athens on 6 o'clock Sunday night and have an evening study. We're going through the wonderful book of First Timothy. And uh, just um, my young man that's working with me, Tim, is doing a phenomenal job in mm-hmm. depth. Talk about depth of teaching. He's doing a phenomenal job. So come on out. You have Bible study during the week. You have my office number right up there on the screen. You can call us and get attached to us. And if you're in the Charlestown, New Hampshire area, we meet at the old St. Luke's Episcopal Building at 188 Main Street, uh, Sundays at 11 o'clock. Great time of worship, great time in the Word. Uh, 10 o'clock, we also have uh, some coffee and just great time of fellowship with six feet apart, of course. Um, But just invite you to come out, be a part of that. 
Um, we also have small groups that meet during the week uh, that we would love you to be a part of. Uh, just call the church office. Uh, you can find information about us also at lifeonmain.org and uh, all kinds of information there. We just thank you guys so much uh, for being a part of this broadcast. In fact, uh, before I go into that, um, coming up in a couple of months, and we know it's a ways away, but believe it or not, people, Christmas is less than three months. Um, yep. But we actually, our two churches are going to have some involvement together this year. Yep. So we're going to be doing a Christmas cantata together. Right. Really looking forward to having our two choirs uh, take part in that. Uh, we're actually going to do that at both churches yep. um, as the holidays draw closer. So we'll give you more information as that draws closer, but it'll be a great time. Um, but we do want to thank you for tuning into the broadcast. And a lot of ways to watch it. You can obviously watch us on the community television stations from Brattleboro up to Springfield, as well as up in the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, if you know people outside that viewing area and you think this program is um, worth, worth for them to watch, direct them to um, fact, the number 8com All of our Heartline Ministries broadcasts can be found there. They can also find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Heartline Ministries and we repost the videos there as well. Get the word out there. If you are tuning in from anywhere around the country or even around the world, uh, now 22 different countries that we know of right now, but just drop us a note there on Facebook if you're on there. Just say, hey, I watch you guys from uh, such and such an area. We would like to know that just so we can be praying for you and praying for your towns where you are at. And so let, let us know that. But thank you again for tuning in. Thank you so much for watching Hotline Ministry. Jesus.